GPT-4 in particular is it's able to do more of that rich tutoring type of experience that we've always aspired to do that, than frankly I thought was going to be possible in my lifetime. The technology by its nature is a shortcut machine. It cheats by its nature. Welcome to Doha Debates, where we explore an urgent issue from various sides and try to find common ground. Get ready for a conversation that's well-informed, spirited, civil, and respectful. For more great videos, please subscribe here to the Doha Debates YouTube channel. Hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson, and I will be your moderator for this debate. Today, we're taking another look into artificial intelligence. Previously, we debated whether AI was helping or harming artists. Today, let's talk about the use of AI in the classroom. Is it helping or hurting education? You're probably familiar with the kind of AI that guesses the next word you might type on your phone or that shows you targeted ads as you surf the web, but that's an earlier form of machine learning. This is something newer called generative AI. Programs like ChatGPT and Bard use generative AI software to do all kinds of creative tasks. In just a few seconds, they can compose emails, make up songs, craft poetry, even write essays. Like the essays you would write in college, or the ones you would write to get in. ChatGPT has more than 100 million users around the world. By some accounts, it may be the fastest growing app ever. Generative AI has dramatically changed the way some students are approaching their schoolwork. This year, school districts in places like Chicago, Louisville, Kentucky, and the suburbs of Washington, D.C. have placed ChatGPT under review. The obvious concern is that kids would use apps like this to cheat, or at least to let computers do the heavy lifting of learning for them. But where do we draw the line with cheating anyway? You're allowed to use calculators in math class, or take tests with the textbook open, at least sometimes, how do we know what crosses the line? A global survey by UNESCO, that's an agency within the United Nations, determined that less than 10% of schools have guidance on generative AI. But governments are struggling to keep up too. Elon Musk joined world leaders at an AI summit in the UK, focused on setting international agreements for responsibly developing this technology. So there's a lot of excitement, a lot of anxiety, but not a lot of agreement on what to do. In this debate, we'll focus on generative AI in education. What does it mean to put this cutting edge technology in our children's hands? Let's dive in with today's guests, both joining us from the San Francisco Bay Area. Sal Khan is the founder of Khan Academy, an online learning platform. Since it launched in 2008, it now serves more than 160 million users in 50 languages. Khan Academy is developing an AI tutor and teaching assistant. Sal Khan, welcome to Doha Debates. Good to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Also joining us is Jacob Ward, technology correspondent for NBC News. His reporting focuses partly on the unintended consequences of new tech. He is the author of The Loop, how AI is creating a world without choices and how to fight back. And for full disclosure, he and I were colleagues at NBC News. Jacob Ward, welcome. Good to see you again. Thanks so much, Joshua. Later in the show, we will hear from a global listener who will share their question for our panelists. But before we get started, as always, I have two ground rules for the debate. First, this probably goes without saying, but no personal attacks. We're here to pick apart the issue, not each other. And second, don't dodge questions. It's fine to think out loud or to say you just don't know. But don't just change the subject. Every question needs a direct answer. And please don't answer a question with a question. For example, if I ask, what if you're wrong, and you respond, well, what if I'm right? Don't do that. Jacob, let's start with you. You have expressed concern about generative AI in the classroom. What concerns you about it? Well, Joshua, I would say that most of my opinion about this uh, is informed by uh, my time as a reporter uh, covering the, the rolling out of AI throughout our lives, and especially in education. Uh, and the other part of my opinion is informed by the work I put into The Loop, this book that, that you so kindly mentioned, um, and the way that AI is, is uh, sort of metastasizing throughout our lives in all sorts of ways that I think could be, you know, fundamentally difficult. So for me in education, there's really three major issues. First, 
Students themselves consider it cheating. In a recent study by Junior Achievement in Big Village, a survey of more than 1,000 13 to 17 year olds represents basically the largest statistically significant survey we've got about ChatGPT in particular. Um, 44% of participating teenagers expressed a likelihood to use AI as a means to tackle their schoolwork in the upcoming 2022 to 2023 year. But they also, uh, a significant majority of them, more than 60%, perceived this reliance as cheating, which means that you've got a whole generation of kids who have these tools in their hands, be, are using them, and also feel that they are using them to cheat. To me, that is a tremendously complicated and, and damning statistic. Second, the technology by its nature is a shortcut machine. It cheats by its nature. It grabs the work of other people. It regurgitates it in ways that are very often inaccurate and sometimes dangerously misleading. And it does not show its work. It is the classic black box. And the market incentives that run all through that industry continue to make it more and more opaque, although, as I'm sure we'll discuss, there have been some moves to regulate that. But by its nature and left to its own devices, it is, a, it is itself, I consider it, a cheating machine. And third, the market dynamics at work, I think, around education broadly and specifically around the application of AI to something like education, really cheat all of us, especially our students, by driving down the resources available to us in what we want to do in our lives while increasing the expectation of productivity. I think those three things, the student's opinion of it themselves, the nature of the technology and how it works and is uh, uh, moved, how it metastasizes through the market, and the broad market dynamics at work, I think could make this a very, uh, a, a very damaging potential technology to what we all want out of education. Sal Khan, you've expressed optimism about what generative AI can do in the classroom. You've been talking about Khan Academy's new AI tutor called Conmigo. You gave a TED Talk about it this year. You spoke at the Aspen Ideas Festival about it and even got applause in your TED Talk as you revealed or de demonstrated some of the things that Conmigo can do. Since you have real skin in this game, tell us briefly about Conmigo and why it gives you optimism for the potential of AI in the classroom. Yeah, you know, in a lot of ways, what we've been trying to do at Khan Academy is a not-for-profit for, for over a decade now. A lot of folks know it started with me tutoring my cousins, uh, and I started making tools for them, making videos for them, and it took a life of their own. And a lot of what we've been talking about over the years have been ways that you could personalize an education, uh, where a student can go at their own time and pace, ways that you could do what we call mastery learning, which is if you haven't learned it yet, you get another shot at goal. And, and if you think about it, a lot of what we've been trying to do pre-generative AI is trying to scale what I was able to do for my cousins. There's, and I think most people intuitively recognize, and also there's a lot of evidence that one-on-one -on -one personalization, tutoring really is the gold standard. Obviously people have been arguing for lowering the student-teacher ratio for as long as you remember, but it's a very expensive proposition. When OpenAI reached out to us over a year ago, so this was before ChatGPT came out and this, they, they showed us GPT-4 and we were some of the first folks in the world to, to see it, we had a few reactions. On the positive side, we had the reaction that, wow, this is, this GPT-4 in particular is, it's able to do more of that rich tutoring type of experience that we've always aspired to do than, than frankly, I thought was going to be possible in my lifetime. On the other hand, we immediately started worrying about, well, what about cheating? <laughs> this thing can generate answers. This thing can uh, do problem sets. And we know that's a real thing. I mean, as Jacob, there's multi-billion dollar for-profit companies that exist there where their business model is essentially kids pay them, this was before generative AI, pay them $30 a month and they'll essentially do your homework for you. And I won't say, I won't name names, but some of their stock prices have gone down dramatically <laughs> after uh, chat GPT came on the scene. But that was a real fear for us at Khan Academy because we, we are definitely all about learning. We're definitely all about how do you actually support students. So we started thinking, all right, it can do these positive things, but there's also these kind of scary things. And there's other scary things that, that Jacob didn't list. You know, like it, what if it introduces bias? What if, you know, we know it can hallucinate facts, which, which he did bring up. We know it's infamously bad at math, which surprises people about, about, about computers. Um, but we said, okay, but if we can start to mitigate some of those, some of those downsides and we can really promote the upsides, maybe this has something to it. So that's what we started really, really working on. And then what we're building as we speak is that Conmigo is going to not do the essay for the student, 
but support the student while they do the essay. Okay, let's come up with a thesis statement. What do you? What's your opinion about this? Go back and forth, highlight parts of their writing, and say, okay, can can you make this a little bit tighter? Or this reference you're giving really isn't that valid. Maybe you can make it a little bit better. It's like a real writing coach, an ethical writing coach. And I know a lot of folks might say, well, well, what's to stop a student from going to to Chat GPT and then just copying and pasting it into this? And that's where I think is really interesting is. When, when the AI, when Conmigo reports back to the teacher, it won't just report the output of the essay. It can report back the entire process of how the essay was developed. Yeah, we worked on this for about four hours. We had trouble with the thesis statement initially. We eventually got there. We did some outlining, you know, based on the rubric, you know, you teacher in charge, but I would rate it on the following um, um, on, on the rubric. Uh, and by the way, I think this writing is pretty consistent with the writing that the student did in class. So I think that type of thing, one, it supports students better to write better because we know most people aren't getting enough fast cycle feedback. Uh, but even more, not only does it, we think, mitigate the AI cheating issue, it mitigates the cheating issue, period, where of getting someone else to write your papers. Jacob Ward, what about that? Also, one of the other features that you see in Conmigo, and this is just from the demo that was done during the TED Talk, if the student asks, what is the correct answer? Conmigo, at least the demo version, is designed to say, well, I can't give you the answer, but let's figure it out together. And it'll go through to try to kind of re-encourage the student to solve the problem themselves. What's wrong with that? Well, I would say in a perfect world, nothing is wrong with that, right? What 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 Sal is is describing here, I think, you know, on the face of it makes a huge amount of sense. But I think that the there there are for me two broader issues that I think get in the way of um, of and I don't want to be in the position of, of criticizing Conmigo specifically. I haven't used the product and I I don't have any specific data about it and how it works. And I have nothing but faith in, in Salcon's uh, motives here. So I want to be clear about that. But speaking broadly, this idea that we're going to you know I think through throughout my reporting on AI throughout the book that I wrote and the 10 years I've spent looking at this topic, over and over again, the best of intentions go into creating these foundational models. And the idea tends to be, and this is true across so much of tech, that if we simply put more uh, efficiency and, um, and capacity into the technology, it will also increase both the efficiency and the capacity of the humans who use it. But what that tends to ignore is the way in which as you begin to rely on these sorts of tools, the market forces around you begin to put pressure on the people to uh, work more for less. And so for me, there is this broader question of, um, yes, the technology in a perfect world with endless resources can be, I think, tremendously effective. But I think we have seen um, across uh, you know that that the, you know American education. I think is in a funding crisis. The experts would tell you, right, that the property tax basis on which we um, uh, fund school districts across the country create incredibly inequitable uh, funding for schools. Um, districts with low property taxes uh, and high poverty get way less money than um, than their counterparts. So for me, it is it is not so much that I take issue with the technology, and this is always true. I feel like in the in my coverage of technology is inevitably it is the way that market forces shape that technology. So on the face of it, no big, you know, I think it's a it's a great potential idea, but right. in terms of its execution, it winds up uh, leaving huge swaths of the population around the world out, and winds up burdening the people left at the end of all the cost cutting that inevitably comes with technology. Salcon, what about that? I mean, Silicon Valley has always worn its capacity to disrupt society as a badge of honor, as a way to ostensibly move us forward. But now it's affecting kids and their ability to learn, to socialize, to navigate life. We know how much social media have affected children's development and dramatically changed the relationships between kids and adults. After all of that, why should we trust anyone from the tech sector with our children ever again? Social media had a lot of very unintended consequences. Why shouldn't we be nervous about generative AI, even if it's not Conmigo, but generative AI more broadly having more unintended consequences with our kids? 
I 100% agree. We have to keep a very close eye on these things. And actually, social media is an area where I'm a big fan of regulation. Uh, I regulate it very strictly in my own household, and I think all parents should. I, I agree with all of that. I'll also say, you know, Jacob talked a lot about market forces. And in most areas, I am, I believe, in, in free markets. But there's a reason why we set up Khan Academy as a not-for-profit. I think there's a few sectors in our society where the market forces are leading to um, suboptimal outcomes. Education and probably healthcare, where the beneficiaries are different than the payers, uh, who are different than the decision makers, and so that's why we are set up as a as a not for profit. So we, we we strongly believe in that, and I also agree that on, in the AI front, actually the market force that I'm most worried about, you already see probably this billions of dollars going into AI driven probably ed tech already. I mean, people are just pumping money into that, and when push comes to shove, I think everyone's talking a, a big talk about, oh, we're here to help humanity, we're here to level the playing field, but. After a year or two or three and these VCs say, I want to see a return, then they say, okay, we're going to do free homework help. We're going to help people cheat. And I and I do think that's where a lot of the market forces are going to go. They're not going to do the pedagogically sound thing. And that's what I tell the team at Khan Academy every day. We're the bulwark against that. We have to show that there's another path. The whole reason why we started a physical school is we never viewed the technology as, as a silver bullet for it all. Our true north has always been, how do we leverage the technology to encourage more human to human interaction. So even that Mountain View teacher who has a panel of 150 students has 30 right. students at a time. It's obviously hard for them or nearly impossible for them to have one-on-one -on -one sessions on a regular basis with every student. But even before generative AI, we've advocated, hey, if you're teaching say a math class, have say 20 minutes a day, students working on their own time and pace on Khan Academy, also supporting each other, having mechanisms. So if one student needs help, another student can provide it, which is the opposite of the schools we grew up in, where if your your friend needed help and you tried to help them, someone would say, shh, you know, you, you can't say yeah. anything. And then the, the teacher could leverage the information, knowing that there's 30 kids in the room, but maybe they could take 10 aside. They, they might not be able to do one-on-one, -on -one, but they could take 10 aside or five aside for 10 minutes, for 15 minutes, while the other students are working at their own pace to do a more focused intervention uh, with those students. And we've seen that to great effect where it increases the connectivity, the human connectivity in a classroom. You introduce generative AI, uh, and we've already started seeing this in classrooms. Teachers are telling us, actually for younger students, uh, teachers are telling us it's teaching them how to ask questions. And they're starting, I didn't even realize they had those questions until they're asking them and it's transparent through me uh, that, that they have been asking those. And for older students, teachers like, yeah, there's no way I would have been able to get to all of those questions. And it's really valuable for me as a teacher to know uh, that my kids ask those. And the reason why the kids are asking is that they're embarrassed to raise their hand in front of 30 friends right, right. Uh, and ask the question. So I think it's, I, I, I have a lot of the same fears that Jacob has um, uh, around what people are going to do in an unfettered or unrealistic expectations. But I do think there's, there are ways to do it where it can be a lot more positive than negative. Well, let me dig into that a little bit. I mean, Jake, it, it, I wonder if perhaps because, as Sal Khan said, even these new technologies have kind of surfaced new opportunities for growth and change and problems that educators didn't really see, maybe it's about time that school systems and ministries of education around the world should be pushed into evolving. Education is not built for speed. It is bureaucratic by design. But you have kids around the world, including in impoverished parts of the world, parts of the global south, developing nations that are itching to be part of the future economy, who are often overshadowed and have been for centuries by kids from more developed countries. Generative AI could level that playing field for these students and their teachers as well, especially since educational reform is a glacially slow process when it's a purely human process. I mean, might that be a good thing? Well, I think it is it is not been proven in any sense yet that the deployment of AI can actually have beneficial outcomes for the students that you described, Joshua, as, as vital as what you're describing is. It's not in any way, I have seen no evidence, and maybe Sal has, that AI is actually going to improve that. There's lots of studies out there about how teachers are using it and the potential for how it might be used in the future, but no one knows yet that this stuff is actually having a positive effect on, on these outcomes. And when you look at the motivations that students cite when they cite turning to AI, 
uh, in that same study that I mentioned before, um, the, the, the motivations are extraordinarily diverse, but they're also pretty depressing. Um, they can, 62% of respondents considered AI as just another tool for schoolwork. 24% expressed discontentment with school or schoolwork. 22% believe that AI eliminates the need to acquire knowledge. And I think you also have to think about all of this against the backdrop of the pandemic, which, as one high school senior put it to me, was the absolutely crucial final element in the perfect storm of, of cheating that we are in right now, in which students essentially were deprived of all of the other social rewards of school and asked only to sit on a laptop and try and move forward however they could. And so for me, I think that, that the issue you are raising is crucially important. Maybe Conmigo is this, um, you know, to, if we could invent an AI product that really does tap into people's personal motivations and gets them to have the conversation that no other, uh, you know, mentor will have with them about what they want out of education and what yeah. is it you want from your life. But I, I, I'm not convinced that that is something that anyone has been able to do yet. And, and without that, we're going to continue down this transactional uh, uh, form of uh, educational outcomes that I think is, is really you know, going to cause kids to just use whatever they can to get ahead any way they can. One last question to you, Sal, before I bring in our global listener. There's another aspect of the way that young people are connecting to technology that's concerned a lot of people. And that has to do with loneliness and social isolation, probably as a result of their extremely online lives. I mean, the U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy put out an advisory this year about what he called an epidemic of loneliness and isolation in the United States. Social media was a key factor in that advisory. Today's kids are already struggling with human socialization and human interpersonal relationships. And now we're gonna make their educations less interpersonal, less human by involving an AI, and who knows how much of the educational load that districts and education departments and ministries of education will offload onto technology from humans, especially because it might be less expensive, it might be more scalable, it might seem like less of a headache. What does that mean for socialization for kids, for kids to just know how to be a person in the world? Big picture, I mean, look, this is something we care deeply, deeply about and uh, agree. Uh, you know, the number one thing, the, the technology should not be something that somehow minimizes social interaction. And I agree, like, you know, I've, I've been the first person that said, hey, why don't we start regulating social media first? Because we know that there are very clear harms and there's some very easy things that any honestly responsible parent is already doing. Um, either you're not using it. None of my kids are allowed to use any of the, you know, I, I would say the worst offenders of social media now. And um, and then even the other things, I'm we police it pretty, pretty hard. But you know, I always tell people, come visit Khan Lab School, which we've kind of set up as this is where my children go to school. And they use technology uh, probably more than your average school. But if you were to go with the stopwatch and you were to see how many human to human interactions the students are having in a day, I think it's probably a factor of 10 more than a traditional school uh, because there's no lecture in this school. It's all active learning. If they need if they need to get an explanation, there's ways to do that. And then the teacher can set and, and, and talk to a small group. They can lead a Socratic dialogue. They can go into a simulation. We have students teaching each other, running breakout groups, being TAs. You know, the, the number one thing we hear is these kids are incredibly collaborative because that's what the, the school index is on. What we've always preached is let's thoughtfully use technology so it can unlock more time for the human to human interaction. When human beings are together, they should not be lecturing to each other. They shouldn't be making kids put a finger on their lips and say, be quiet Why? I do something that, frankly, an on-demand video can do, much less an AI can do. Uh, so I think that's that's the direction we, we need to go in. And, and just to touch on a previous point that Jacob made, it is very early days in terms of efficacy studies, but this is something that I we take very seriously. It, it, it took Khan Academy about two or three years when we had our first you know, pre-AI types of technologies to start building up the learning evidence that, hey, if you let students learn at their own pace, et cetera, et cetera, it can accelerate them pretty dramatically. We're already starting to do those studies as, as we speak. We have early indications that it is keeping students engaged more, they're quitting less, but it's very early, very preliminary. But I do expect in the next few years, you're going to see some pretty strong evidence because it is emulating some of the best practices that we've known have been good in education uh, for a very long time. I don't want to make it sound like a silver bullet, but I do think on one level, the genie's out of the bottle. If, if, 
if the good actors <laughs> aren't out there and trying to proactively make it used well, Chat GPT is still going to be there. All of these tools are going to be there. The market forces are going to create a whole bunch of cheating tools. It's going to be very tempting for adults to just keep watering down things and having lower expectations. And those kids are going to suffer while affluent families, educated families are going to provide these supports. They're going to keep the rigor high and then you're going to have a, a higher and higher separation. So yeah. our goal is let's be that good actor. Let's harness these same technologies to try to level that playing field and try to up the rigor for everyone. You know, during our debates, we like to welcome listeners from around the world to share their views and ask questions. And today, we are pleased to welcome Donna Alali from Doha. She is studying environmental science and policy at the University of California, Irvine. And Donna has a question about using AI on written assignments. Donna, welcome to the debate. What's on your mind? Hi, thank you for having me. Um, so one of the questions that I've had is there have been some instances of AI falsely generating information. What would be the appropriate precautions and precautions to be measured to avoid such situations? Let me put that first to Jacob Ward and then to Sal Khan, if you could briefly respond to Donna's question. Jacob? So Donna, it's it's not entirely clear, right? And this is the this is the um, difficulty of the moment that we are in. These are tremendously convincing systems, ones that pass the famous Turing test, right? And and in that they trick human beings into thinking that these systems are are uh, way more sophisticated and way more correct than they often are. And that anthropomorphism, right? That tendency to attribute more sophistication to a system than it deserves is a very fundamental psychological habit of the human brain and I think is going to get us into a lot of trouble in the coming uh, months and, and years. So one of the big problems we have right now is that even as uh, ChatGPT and uh, these other foundational models are being released into the public sphere because the logic of software is ship the product, i.e. release it to the public, and then we'll work out the kinks based on how people use it and the trouble that they, they get into with it. The problem is they did not at the same time release anything like a verification system that could tell you how this thing is making its decision and even whether this is an AI generated or human generated piece of content. So right. um, the truth of the matter is I don't know the answer to this. And it's one of the reasons I think we have to be especially careful in relying on this kind of technology to uh, to substantiate the arguments we want to make in our papers and, and help us uh, sort through the kind of thinking that writing makes possible. Sal Khan, what would you say to Donna? I think the first step is digital literacy. Um, and that's operative even before generative AI, but generative AI is obviously a new and for a lot of folks, mysterious and exciting and scary thing. And they need to be, they need to know what they're getting into. And, but that's also true of the internet. Uh, you know, there's stories of people just finding something on the internet. Oh, it looks legit. <laughs> I'm going to copy and paste that. Um, and, and it's not. So, you know, the first answer I would say is, especially if you're, if you're, if it's in a college environment and, and it's part of your honor code not to use these tools, if you are, you're already getting to an unethical space. And then if you get burned because of a hallucination, which is the technical term for when it makes up stuff, you know, you didn't know what, what you were playing with. With that said, um, there are guardrails in place that you can put. Like what we've done on Conmigo is it only talks about things that's anchored in human generated vetted content. So we, I want to say that we have completely eliminated the problem, but we've been able to uh, mitigate it a good bit. The, the last thing I say is that this is all changing very, very quickly. Um, I, I agree with what Jacob's saying about fundamentally what these models are, but I, I also want to encourage people to not um, minimize the power of what they are. You know, already we know these models are in the 80th percentile of the LSAT. They've passed the medical boards at a higher level than a lot of doctors um, might be able to. And this is just the current generation. And you know, By the time we get to GPT-6 or GPT-7, that's going to have similar complexity to the human brain and gets much more exposure to much more information than any human being could do in a thousand lifetimes. Right, um, right. It's going to raise some interesting questions. Well, Sal, let's dig in on that a little bit further. Sal, suppose, just for example, that more governments started buying AI systems for classroom teaching, integrated them, and then saying, say that the political party in charge decided, and let's, you know, in various parts of the world, this does may not, this may sound a little far fetched to Americans, but not necessarily in other parts of the world. Let's say the ruling political party decided that girls needed more instruction on home economics and less on math and science 
because they're concerned that traditional gender roles in their country are at risk. What should the AI provider do? Yeah, well, well first of all, uh, you know, I actually, my, my biggest fear when people talk about AI is actually, especially what happens in totalitarian governments. It's not just the education system, their ability to monitor folks. Uh, you know, right now you could put sensors and tap all the phone lines, but it's hard to keep track of all that information. Well, generative AI can now make sense of a lot of that information and, and surface to you very quickly, people who might be dissenting. Um, so I'm actually very, and obviously their ability to participate in misinformation attacks and elections, and I'm very worried about all of that. But let's if we go back to the education issue, this is not a new issue. Every one of these governments that you're talking about are already doing that well before generative AI. Uh, they're, they're enforcing it very strongly in what textbooks and what you're able to say. They're issuing scripts to their teachers, et cetera. Uh, and, and so I, I think the, the totalitarian government issue, that's, that's a whole other thing. I think if you come in, back into an American context, a lot of this, uh, and this is even before generative AI, but I think generative AI could be part of the solution. It, it's all about transparency. People are actually... They always ask me, because we have an American history course on Khan Academy. We have the videos, we have the exercises. They're like, well, given the political environment, how come y'all aren't getting in trouble with someone? And I'm like, you know, we are just doing, we're going to experts across the spectrum, right of center, left of center. And we're just trying to make sure it's the most intellectually honest American history course, where we definitely cover the good, the bad, and the ugly of our history. We don't try to paper over those things. At the same time, we also try to uh, give a fair shot at what's exceptional about this country, the ideas of the Enlightenment, that it's never been perfect, but it is, even though it doesn't feel that way sometimes, it is getting more perfect over time. More people have more rights. The fact that we can even have this discussion that through most of history, we've had totalitarian governments that would tell you uh, what you would want to want to believe. So, and, but and that's from people... an American point of view. I guess I'm wondering about yeah. the cross-cultural intersections where you may be a company that's based in Belgium and you have a vendor in Indonesia, which is a Muslim country, or where you may be a criminal justice content provider who does business in Japan, where the presumption of innocence is not part of the law, or you're doing a section on civics about free speech and you sell it to an educator in the UK where the laws about hate speech are very, very different than they are in the US. I guess what I'm asking is where push comes to shove in terms of values and content and business when you're trying to encode our human values into technology, what should providers do? Well, I'll say again, I mean, this is not a new problem. Pearson is do it, dealing with that as we speak, right? They sell textbooks in every country in the world. And I'm sure that you have minders in some of these places saying, take that line out, add that line in. And in some ways, textbooks are much easier to control. I have no doubt that in many of these places, you're going to have large language models that are run out of these places that are um, uh, that that don't have the guardrails that that we or that even Microsoft or OpenAI have that allow um, allow them to try to control what people are thinking. But I I will say that once again, that should speak to not us not doing it, but we should have more open systems that are out there that are also accessible that might be able to provide a, a, a counterpoint. And just to touch on a previous point that Jacob made, it is very early days in terms of efficacy studies, but this is something that I we take very seriously. It, it, it took Khan Academy about two or three years when we had our first you know, pre-AI types of technologies to start building up the learning evidence that, hey, if you let students learn at their own pace, et cetera, et cetera, it can accelerate them pretty dramatically. We're already starting to do those studies as, as we speak. We have early indications that it is keeping students engaged more, they're quitting less, but it's very early, very preliminary. But I do expect in the next few years, you're going to see some pretty strong evidence because it is emulating some of the best practices that we've known have been good in education uh, for a very long time. I don't want to make it sound like a silver bullet, but I do think on one level, the genie's out of the bottle. If, if, if the good actors <laughs> aren't out there and trying to proactively make it used well, Chat GPT is still going to be there. All of these tools are going to be there. The market forces are going to create a whole bunch of cheating tools. It's going to be very tempting for adults to just keep watering down things and having lower expectations. And those kids are going to suffer while affluent families, educated families are going to provide these supports. They're going to keep the rigor high and then you're going to have a, a higher and higher separation. So our goal is let's be that good actor. Let's harness these same technologies to try to level that playing field and try to up the rigor for everyone. Donna, what about you in terms of your experience? You're at a university campus, UC Irvine in Southern California. What are you seeing and hearing from your classmates in terms of ChatGPT and BARD and all these AI technologies and how they're using it, not using it, avoiding it, leaning into it, 
what's your experience been? So far, I know that people have actually used it, you know, um, to summarize readings, summarize articles that they've been given. Um, I know not specifically at my campus, but around other colleges, you know, students have been falsely accused of using AI by professors. Um, and it's become such a prominent issue because, you know, they're getting accused of something that they're not really doing. What do you think is going to happen from here? What would you like to see happen in terms of how colleges and universities, for example, deal with AI? Should they tell students to back off of it completely, embrace it? What do you think would make sense? Um, I think there should be a bit of a distinction, um, at least, or some sort of guideline or measurement be set for students and professors to be able to use AI. It can be a very helpful tool, but at the same time, it does conflict a lot with how students are able to use their critical skills um, with coming to things like problem solving and collaborating with other people. So I think there should be uh, some sort of measurement to that. Yeah, Donna, I hear... I hear from you some of the similar concerns that Jacob and Sal have expressed in the debate in terms of kind of what we do with it and how we set those guardrails. I know we have to wrap up shortly, but let me go back to our panelists and get to a few more of the areas where there's some overlap, where there's some agreement. Jacob Ward, let me start with you. I've already heard both of you express some of the same perspectives on this. The the devil is in the details, obviously, but where do you see the greatest kind of consensus with Sal in terms of where all of this stands now and where it's going. Frankly, I wish the world was full of Sal Khans, right? Someone who has who walked away from a job in, in equity to to form this, you know, groundbreaking educational nonprofit. I think that's fantastic. Unfortunately, I think he's a pretty rare specimen. And as he points out, you know, there is a whole industry built on cheating that long predates uh, ChatGPT. And my work you know, I'm I'm constantly uh, being pitched by public relations firms uh, because these are the companies that can afford them. Um, these uh, pointless, in my view, pointless applications of AI that make the easiest possible use of it for the greatest possible profit at the least possible consideration of the possible harms. Right, that useless category of AI is everywhere. We're seeing it in the rise of you know, uh, everything from the sort of plagiarism systems that um, we're seeing out there uh, to, you know, the invention of virtual girlfriends who will chat back at you, uh, you know, uh, for a dollar a minute, right? That whole category of AI, I think, is going to be, unfortunately, the dominant form of it in our lives. I think it's going to metastasize through our lives in all sorts of ways, simply because that's the easiest way to make money. Then there's a whole category for me of uh, applications of AI that I think really can be tremendously beneficial. I think healthcare applications of it, uh, cancer detection, the sort of predictive analytics that I worry about in something like a job setting can be incredible for figuring out whether or not your mole is going to turn into cancer. And, you know, in everything from, uh, you know, a, a look at back at the archaeological record to see which pieces of pottery would have connected the Etruscan and the Roman eras, you know, that kind of stuff, super cool, super amazing uses of AI. And so for me, if the deployment of AI in education really can stay in that world, I think that can be very, very powerful. On the other hand, I think that those same impulses on, on that useless side of AI deployment could very quickly look at that and say, well, what do we need teachers for? And so for me, I, I really hope that we can continue to lean the way that Sal does in terms of his motivations and away from simply deploying AI because we imagine it has benefits and we can see the efficiencies and cost savings that it provides. And before we go, Sal Khan, same thing for you. Areas of agreement or consensus about generative AI in education? Oh, I, I agree with everything Jacob just said. Um, you know, the, the reality, I, I, I mean, I, I literally just had a team meeting where I said almost the same words. Like there's so many people with such a strong incentive to create crap um, that is um, not going to be good for people and it's going to create a lot of noise. And our fear is obviously, you know, we're, we're myself and Jacob diverge a little bit is that, you know, we're, we're, 
we're in it and you know we 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 feel like there's 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 some real power to this technology and Jacob actually mentioned a few of these i mean we are thinking through what could the future of assessment look like where it's not limited to multiple choice and you could have simulation based discussion based you can you can show a show an ai your art and it can critique it so so there's and, and then we have to th- be careful about things like bias etc but i think big picture i i always i always um may, maybe my my point of view isn't ai good or bad it's just what is the world going to do <laughs> with or without us? And then what can we do to make sure that there's actually a path that is more utopian than dystopian? And I can't predict that 100 percent. But, you know, I said this in the TED talk. I, I don't view it as a flip of a coin. I think those and I think there are more hopefully more Sal Khans out there in the world. I think, Jacob, you're one of them. I think Joshua, Donna, hopefully you are, too. <laughs> like we if the good actors are out there and embracing putting proper guardrails, using it thoughtfully, um, I think we can get to a utopian world. More utopian, maybe. Sal Khan, founder of Khan Academy. Appreciate you being part of the debate today. Thank you very much. Thanks. And NBC News technology correspondent, Jacob Ward. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Joshua. And to our global listener, Donna Alali, good luck to you at UC Irvine. And thanks for being part of the conversation. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Doha Debates is a production of Qatar Foundation. Our podcast is produced by FP Studios and Doha Debates. Our producers include Mandy Lester and Claudia Tatey, with help from James Wally. FP Studios Managing Director is Rob Sachs. Our executive producers are Katrine Dermody, Jafet Weeks, Amjana Tala, and Jigar Mehta. You can explore our other podcasts, short films, upcoming events, and more online at dohadebates.com. If you like this program, please follow the podcast and write us a review so more people can find it. And be sure to check out my podcast, The Nightlight with Joshua Johnson, a program about democracy, culture, and solving the problems we share. So until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thanks for listening.